Hello, you are about to listen to the first lecture of this semester. The subject is the year 1492, which you might recall from high school history as the year that Columbus discovered the new world for Europeans. Of course, it was already known to people living there, but it was new to Europeans. This is the year that, as I would say, Europe stopped being at the edge of the world. Because people at the time thought that the Atlantic Ocean was the end of the world. There was nothing much behind that. And they found out otherwise. But it's not just about the geography. It is also about the place of Europe in the world. Where does it fit in the bigger picture? Before 1492, Europe was a marginal part of the world. It might have had its glory days up until the Roman Empire collapsed in the Dark Ages, when it could be considered a center of civilization. But in the 1400s, when Columbus and others set out on voyages of discovery, Europe was marginal. Asia, if you look at this map from the 1400s, was the biggest landmass of the known world, of course, as you see here. This is Asia, this is Europe, and then here, somewhat misshapen because largely unknown to people who are in the business of making maps, is the continent of Africa. Now, while this map is circular, certainly people at the time knew that the world was round rather than flat. Whatever disputes scientists had with the Catholic Church at the time were never really about the question of the shape of the world, not at that time anymore. It was about whether the world was at the center of the universe and whether the moon, the sun, the stars, and everything else rotated around the world, or as Copernicus discovered, that the world actually rotated around the sun. So the question here then was not one of um, whether or not the world was round. Sailors in particular had long known that if a ship sails away from you on the ocean, when you stop seeing it, it appears to sink behind the horizon. The last thing that you see disappear is the top of the highest mass. So you can actually see that there is a curvature in the thing, even if it's a big, big curve. Um, and another thing that people had a hard time wrapping their mind around was the idea that the world spins around itself because, as they asked, with some justification, why don't you feel the, the, the wind of the velocity? Um, so this map here, and this speaks to the subject of how central, or rather not, Europe was to civilization at, in the age, was originally produced in Mongolia, which is a place in Central Asia where the Mongols have their home, who are, of course, among the great conquerors. Um, among different groups of Central Asian horsemen warriors who set out to conquer the centers of civilization, uh, over the decades, over the centuries rather, the Mongols were among the most successful ones. So they had a business knowing what's where in the world, because if you're going to ride your army of horsemen warriors across the steppes of Central Asia, the last thing you want is to be riding in the wrong direction for a whole day before you realize you have to turn around. Um, and then Europeans who produced this particular iteration of the map actually stole it, uh, not to mince the words here, uh, and copied it. But it's based on the best known cartography of the time. And of course, if you look at it, what you see here, the Mediterranean is about the most accurate in terms of coastlines, all the way into the Middle East. This is where you would have um, the Holy Land. This is the Gulf of Arabia or of Persia, if you're Persian. Um, this is the Red Sea. But the Mediterranean is this accurate because here you can go back all the way to the Phoenicians, to the Greeks, and to the Roman Empire, for whom the Mediterranean was like an inland sea. They called it Or 
ocean, Mare Nostrum. And so there, anybody else who started making maps could simply take the work the Romans had already done and work on that. But also over here on the east, um, on the eastern edge, China, the coastlines are accurate. And what is relevant for people who go out to sea is, of course, knowing where the river mouths are, where the ports are. And that, in fact, is all correct. All the way from Arabia across India, this would be Sri Lanka, somewhat outsized because it was very important as a, as a um, transshipment station between the Arab world and China to Beijing. And Japan is kind of marginal, but it is also on the map. And you have Korea here, you have, um, I think this would be Ceylon, the Philippines. So it's all there. Um, and with Africa as well, down to Madagascar, all the way where you had trade conducted by Indians, the Chinese or Arabs, people knew what was where. And this map just takes it all together. Now, um, the red dots here, represent places on the map, places in the world where around 1400, if you happen to travel back in time, you wouldn't be utterly lost uh, out of culture shock or because of the absence of culture. If you're looking for civilization, which includes good government, the rule of law, indoor plumbing, uh, a variety of food available, uh, fresh water, education, universities, and so forth, then uh, your best bet would probably one of these three places. There you have Beijing, which is the center of government and culture for the Chinese empire, which goes back more than a thousand years. Baghdad, which is the administrative and spiritual center of the Muslim world, a civilization that has inherited most of what the Greeks and the Romans had built and, the, and Muslim civilization is building on top of that. So they still read Greek philosophy, they read Roman literature and statecraft. And finally, um, here, the city of Constantinople, which is a Christian Greek speaking city that is the capital of the, the Byzantine Empire. Um, where you have Greek Orthodox religion and that traces its origins back to the Roman Empire. It's sort of split off from the Roman Empire um, before the fall of West Rome to the uh, onslaught of Germanic barbarians from the north. Now, the Muslim world sits at the center of it all. Um, in fact, Baghdad, where most of the important theological uh, faculties are, where there is medicine and philosophy and astronomy being taught at the university, is the oldest site of human civilization, um, or arguably it developed there concurrently with China. So you have two, possibly two sources uh, where humans first started importantly you know to do agriculture to form governments to have laws um baghdad in the very fertile region between the euphrates and tigris rivers in modern day iraq of course um is one of the places where that is possible where it's easy relatively easy to do agriculture and where you get the high yields that mean that the society is wealthy enough to set aside a few people who get to do nothing but think about the meaning of life and become priests or think about the common good and become kings and nobles. You can't do that if everybody is constantly busy working for survival. So you get civilization. Um, China is uh, likewise the source of language and philosophy and government structure all its own. The Chinese were building canals to carry inland water traffic hundreds of years before uh, 
or common era before Christ. The Chinese developed a language of their own and in many ways invented modern administration, the idea that government should be run and the laws should be enforced by a professional class of administrators, whom they called mandarins. And the mandarins, of course, with the united language, with the unified language, are the origin of the Chinese language, which technically is known as Mandarin. India, too, although it lacks the kind of centralizing force that you have through a unified government that you have in the Muslim world, and before that, of course, you know, the Romans, um, the Persians, Alexander the Great, and so forth, in the Middle East or China, but India too has a language, Sanskrit, all its own. It has religious systems all its own that make it a distinct civilizational sphere. So does Christian Europe. Um, however, at this point, when it comes to the upkeep of civilization, there isn't much to see in Christian Europe. Apart from Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire, which really extends around Western Anatolia, the Balkans and Greece at this time, which is still maintaining the standards of the Roman Empire, the rest of Europe through the Dark Ages, plagues, warfare and barbarian invasions um, has rather gone to seeds. So the ruling class, the kings and nobles of of Europe, the knights in shining armor, are often illiterate. They, to the extent that they have literature, the sagas, like you might have heard about Beowulf and such, or possibly Christian uh, and Assault, are crude. They are about men drinking and fighting, and then drinking and fighting some more. Um, the peasantry of Europe live in isolation in their villages. They are overworked and they have to fork over most of their produce to either the church or the nobles. So for that reason, Europe is clearly a backwater at this time. And if you're looking at exploration and world conquest, nobody would, have, at least of all Europeans themselves, in 1400 would have considered Europe a candidate for becoming a dominant force in the world. Now the fifth region here that we can identify as a distinct civilization uh, is Africa. Africa was isolated because of the Sahara Desert, um, which is difficult to cross, although people did so in uh, camel caravans, of course, that converged onto the city of Timbuktu in modern day Niger, where uh, then different routes would branch off into uh, the kingdoms on the, on the West African coast, which much later um, would of course become the, the main points of enslavement where Europeans would go and, uh, and enslave Africans. But Africa was isolated not because it lacked things, but rather because it had everything it needed. Um, to the extent that other people, Europeans or Muslims, knew anything about Africa, it was legends of fabulous wealth. Uh, kingdoms where the capital cities had streets paved with gold, and everybody, even the poorest, were constantly eating fried game birds and uh, lacked nothing. These stories, of course, sound familiar if you've heard about legends de de dealing with the New World. People were also talking about streets paved with gold with some justification um, when they mythologized the Aztec and, uh, and Inca empires in the New World. But in Africa, in fact, this is somewhat closer to the truth. Africa is a wealthy continent. Africa has natural resources as well as a climate that means that people really don't have to suffer from lack, from want, um, which you wouldn't know if you look at both the reality and the, the image of Africa today. But of course, the, the Africa of today, 
as a continent characterized by famine, warfare, uh, deprivation, is the result of European imperialism and colonization. It continues to be a source of tremendous wealth for those who are in a position to exploit it, this continent. For instance, um, Zimbabwe is home to two thirds of the known copper reserves in the world. And there are other minerals, if you happen to have a cell phone, if you're watching this lecture on a mobile device like a tablet, uh, you wouldn't be doing that if not for uh, the mineral, for the mines of central Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, that region here, where most of the specialized technology that we use today uh, needs to go to find the minerals. Now, the civilizations identified here as the main um, spheres of, of culture, of distinct cultures in the world around 1400 in the old world are linked by what I've circled here in blue, bodies of water. At the time, the fastest way to get places over land, if you do have good roads, and you really don't as a general rule, is by horse. And the horse gets tired. Eventually, you'll have to rest. So you don't get places quickly. If you want to get somewhere quickly, or if you have bulky things or any things at all to haul, if you want to trade, then you're better off traveling by water. Because if you have a sailing ship, the wind does not get tired. The wind does not have to take the break. Therefore, um, whereas today we often think of rivers and oceans as something dividing people, uh, definitely at this time, before you had steam power to travel, before you had planes, oceans were what connected people. If you have a body of water in between two places, the people can meet and interact. So, in fact, if you have uh, merchants on the coast of Italy, they would be much more likely to have met in person Arabs from Libya than Swiss peasants from the Alp Mountains, because in terms of travel time, what's in the Alps, what's in these inaccessible mountains here, or what is beyond the mountain passes in Northern Europe is further away than um, your Arab world, your Muslim world on the south shore of the Mediterranean. And the same is true for the Indian Ocean, the China Sea, and all those places. They connected people, they brought people together. So there is a system of world trade before the new world comes into the picture. The arteries of this system are shown here in blue, are sea travel lanes from China all the way to Sri Lanka, which I mentioned before, it is mostly a matter of Chinese merchants conducting this trade. Between India and the Arab world, you have mostly Muslim traders, Persians and Arabs uh, out of the city of Basra or out of uh, Alexandria and Egypt that carry the trade all the way down to um, Sansibar, and Dar es Salaam of the coast of modern day Tanzania, where um, you also would get Indian and Chinese merchants meeting up here. In the Mediterranean, it is mostly the Italian cities of Venice on the Adriatic Sea and Genoa, which is on the Mediterranean, whose merchants carry the trade between Europe and the Levant, which is to, see, to say the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, as well as Constantinople and the Black Sea and the port of Kaffa, which is the furthest inland you can get by traveling over the Black Sea, this body. In um, this purple color here, I've also added a few land routes. Again, you know, with the caveat that they can't carry quite as much traffic as the sea routes, but they are important auxiliary elements of this world system. One is, the most important one is the one through the desert from the Levant to Baghdad. And of course, before you get to Baghdad, long before you get to Baghdad, you don't have to 
traverse that much desert before you get to either the Euphrates or the Tigris rivers. And then it's river transportation all the way down to the port of Basra. Or here um, in Suez, where today you have a canal, it really is a short distance from the Mediterranean in Alexandria before you get to the Red Sea. And then it's uh, open water all the way to India and China. But this is an important shortcut for the spice trade and uh, other things. Here you have the caravan route across the Sahara, um, which ties Africa into this system to some extent. Here um, are routes across the Alps from Northern Italy to Northern Europe, where you have kind of a sideshow to this system with the Hanseatic League that is a seafaring uh, alliance of mercantile cities that conduct trade in Northern Europe. And there are a few strategic resources that Northern Europe um, contributes to this system, notably tar, which is required to make wooden ships better at holding up at sea by filling in the cracks in between the boards out of which the ships are made, as well as amber, which is a precious stone, or it looks like one that's actually um, tree resin that has been compressed through geological processes, uh, but it looks amber. It has that amber color and it's translucent, so it's quite beautiful and it is uh, in demand elsewhere in the world for, uh, for jewelry. And then finally, the longest overland road that you have is known as the Silk Road, which really isn't a public highway or anything. It's more like a notion that if you keep traveling this way and you get to another trading city down the road, you'll eventually make it to a place where they manufacture silk a fine cloth um, woven by caterpillars that eat a particular kind of plant and that excrete um, gossamer strands that can be woven into very fine, uh, almost magical uh, material, silk in other words, which is in demand in the West. And of course, another thing that is produced in China and is unique because of the, the clay, as well as the manufacturing processes that they use to make it, is the, um, the, the cups and saucers and so forth that are known as China porcelain. And silk is a good item to consider when we think about world trade in this day and age. When we think about what it is that people trade in between these different civilizations. Silk is a high value added, low weight commodity, and it's also low bulk. You could take a caravan of horses with a bunch of armed people that have to guard the gold that you're taking to trade in once you get to China, and uh, go there, fill your saddlebags with a bunch of silk, not much, really just a couple of, of bales of silk, return to Kaffa on the Mediterranean, pay everybody off, uh, catch a boat to Genoa or Venice, sell the silk there, and break not just break even for the enormous cost of months of travel with a large group of people and horses, but in fact, from making that sale, if you manage to get back and sell your silk, from making that sale, you could live comfortably for generations as a merchant family and you could finance other ventures just to maintain your fortune. So what you have then is a luxury trade that is high risk, um, high value added, low bulk. In many places, the voyages from one trading place to another are conducted once a year in a convoy of various merchants getting together for protection, who then set up shop again uh, together for mutual protection in the place that they know they can find a market and then repeat that another year from then. 
In some cases, people have families, say Chinese in particular, but also Arabs, branching off, sending sons to establish a permanent presence in India. Uh, even Chinese setting up shop in Baghdad or Basra or Arabs in China. Um, another group that does this is Jews from the, both from Europe and from the um, Middle East. And they follow in the footsteps of the Phoenicians in doing so. Branch locations of merchant firms that are run by family members that can be truly global in scope. So there is a tremendous amount of wealth created by this trade. There is also a lot of knowledge, even though it doesn't really filter through into societies about what's going on, who lives over here. Um, some people are more susceptible or receptive rather to that knowledge than others. You might have heard about a guy named Marco Polo from Venice in Italy who was the first really to travel the Silk Road to China, to return with goods from China, and to write a book about it and tell Europeans about his experience. His accurate travel narrative of what it's like in China, that you have a whole nother civilization over there, was widely ridiculed and dismissed as a poorly thought up fiction, because after all, Marco Polo failed to mention the giants, the one-eyed giants, and the flying horses, as well as the scaly, fire-breathing uh, dragons that Europeans knew, simply knew, from the map material they had been using to be living in these regions. So if Marco Polo says he traveled that away, he never met a dragon or a centaur, uh, or any other such creature, then clearly he made up the stuff. But as a general rule, the governing elites, the intellectuals, people who were in universities and had read a couple of books knew vaguely at least what was out there, who else was out there and how they were doing business. 99.9% .9 of the world's population had nothing to do with that kind of world system and that kind of world trade. They were neither traveling places, nor were they in the market for silk or spices or China or gold, because they were subsistence um, farming peasants. They didn't really know much about what was going on outside of the village. They didn't leave their village. They might have had only the vaguest idea of what it was like the next village over. Nevertheless, because there is so much money at stake in this trade, it shapes the decisions by governments in dealing with other places and in allocating their resources. Now, if we return now to the original consideration, how come that Europe, which is marginal in this world system, comes to play such a prominent role as a colonizer dominating the world in the 19th century? Let's look at England, which in the 19th century is the world empire. In, this, in the years that this map covers, the 1400s, England is barely on the map. It is somewhat misshapen here, which tells you that people who practiced cartography didn't really quite know what it looked like. And it's clearly on the edge of the map here. It is marginal by definition. So it isn't really the English, but um, the Chinese, who were the first world explorers. Um, and this wouldn't be surpri isn't surprising if you know what the world looked like in 1400. The Chinese government in 1400 commissioned Admiral Zhang He to sail out with a large fleet of military vessels that also carried merchants to take a look at what else is out there in the world or to have a more systematic account of the geography and culture of the systems of government, etc., in those places that the Chinese surely knew were out there but they wanted to know for sure that, for instance, they hadn't missed any opportunities for trade. 
and also that there were no threats that they had been previously unaware of. Um, one part of the mission was to uh, insist to the king of Ceylon or Sri Lanka um, to allow Chinese and Arabic traders to, to use his island as a way station and to conduct trade there without having to pay exorbitant amounts of taxes or fees to uh, the Sri Lankans. So in a way, this is the first uh, military mission uh, to establish free trade by going someplace and saying to the king, uh, either you're not going to collect money from our merchants or else. And in fact, they captured him and took him back to China in the end. Um, this fleet went on its voyages that took it all the way to Mombasa, modern day Kenya, just north of Tanzania. And you would get to Zanzibar down here, to um, Jeddah, the port near the holy city of Mecca, to Hormuz, which is on the Persian or Arabic Gulf. And then, of course, Basra is here and Baghdad over here. Um, so anything worth visiting, they went there and looked at these places. Um, they did good business, but they are ultimately returned with the message that no, there isn't anything out there that is a threat to China, nor is there anything that is worth conquering. And in 1433, um, the empire, the Chinese empire, uh, wrecked the fleet. They decided they had no more need for it, and it cost a lot of money that he could spend better on other purposes. So that ended this um, world exploration attempt by the Chinese. But again, to provide perspective, um, here you have a scale drawing of one of the ships in the Chinese fleet out of the early 1400s. These ships were marvelous. They had gardens where you could, where they were growing vegetables as well as spices so that you could have your Chinese food no matter where you went. They had stables for, um, for animals, for milk, for instance, but also for food. They had musicians, interpreters, writers. In other words, each of these ships, and there were dozens of them in the fleet, was like a small city, was like a microcosm of Chinese society. For comparison purposes, down here, the smaller vessel shows a European seafaring vessel. In fact, this is meant to represent Columbus's flagship, which of course dates to 1492, whereas the Chinese ship that you've got here dates to 1405. Even then, at this point, in terms of technological accomplishment, in terms of civilizational achievement, China was far superior to Europe. If for some reason the Chinese fleet had sailed to Europe and had discovered Europe um, or the New World, it is easy to imagine that they would have been in a position to conquer one or the other of these places if they had been interested in doing that. Here is a photograph out of the mall in Shanghai, which has a later um, European, later model European vessel, as well as one of the Chinese vessels uh, to scale. And from this angle, you can see um, just how large these vessels must have been. For the most part, in this global system of trade, people were able to cross freely between these civilizational spheres that I outlined. There was more to be gained from allowing people to travel freely in and out of your own um, cultural sphere than from keeping them up. You wanted, if you were the ruler, the Muslim ruler of one of these uh, places on the Levant of Alexandria, or, or um, oh, what's, what's the port called here? Uh, Jaffa, Aleppo, etc. There was more to be gained from allowing Christians or Jews from Europe 
into your port and collecting a fee for that than not to have that trade at all. So the um, same to some extent was true in Europe. If you were an Arabic trader, a Muslim trader, or a Greek Orthodox trader from Constantinople, you would gain access for a fee, of course, to Genoa or to Venice. What you see here then is kind of a, um, a close up of this part of the world. Venice and Genoa are shown as tr important trading cities in Europe. This is Alexandria and Baghdad, Constantinople and Kaffa, and the sea routes that go to these places. As it turns out, however, in the 1400s, for multiple reasons, what had been a relatively open and if not harmonious, then at least not, you know, not a frontier con uh, characterized by constant warfare. And during the 1400s, that changed. Um, there were various sources of conflict and eventually of warfare between bordering states that were Christian and Muslim, respectively, that disrupted things. So this is what we'll look at um, in the next part of this.